So you've just finished your workout and it's time to save your session on your Garmin watch. You click save and all of a sudden this training effect score comes up. Now you're given a score out of five, but you're not really sure what this means in terms of your fitness or how you're going. But don't despair, I was like this too. But you've come to the right place because in today's video, we're going to discuss the training effect provided by Garmin, how we get it, how we understand it, and how we can use it to inform our training. So let's get after it, let's go. Firstly, welcome back to the Triax Performance Channel. My name is Rob Delves, and I form one third of the Triax Performance team alongside Damo and Sean. You can contact me on Twitter at Dells Roberts and also via the Triax Instagram page at Triax Performance. Now, if you're new to the channel, I urge you to consider subscribing to us. So if you get any value from the videos here or across the channel, then please uh, consider chucking us a subscribe, which you can do down below. And also uh, give us a like too if you find the video helpful. It would uh, really mean a lot. But in today's video, we're going to discuss all things training effect derived by our Garmin watch. So let's get stuck into it, shall we? As I alluded to during the introduction, we've all seen the training effect score appear on our Garmin watch after we finished a workout. We can see that we're given a score out of five, but what does this all mean exactly? Firstly, we need to understand what the training effect score is actually telling us. Now, Garmin supplies with two training effect scores. We have our aerobic training effect and our anaerobic training effect. Now, the training effect score is intended to summarize the impact of your exercise session upon your aerobic and anaerobic fitness levels. Essentially, it provides a rating system we can use to see how beneficial our exercise session was upon those fitness levels. So it's a nice little tool, an indication we can see in a nice little snapshot of how successful we were during that session. Now, as we know, when we finish our exercise session, we're given our aerobic and anaerobic training effect scores. But for those of you who are not sure where these come from, they're derived from the Garmin and First Beat Technologies partnership. So essentially, our scores are based from zero to five. So zero is effectively no effect or little. Our exercise session had no effect on our aerobic or anaerobic fitness. And then we've got five as well, which is the other end of the scale. And that's overreaching. So that's probably going too hard. And that's not where we want to be uh, long term. That's not sustainable. So ideally, we'd like to sit between probably three and four, uh, four point five. That's our sweet spots for sustainable improvement in our fitness. And I say sustainable because obviously, when we head towards that five point zero, that's not very sustainable and probably heightens our injury risk. So, in order for those sustained improvements, we want to hover between the three and four point five. Uh, thresholds there for our aerobic and anaerobic training effect scores. Now, obviously, if we're getting uh, values that are between zero and two, then we're probably not pushing uh, ourselves hard enough in order to elicit those um, effects in our aerobic and anaerobic fitness levels. But then conversely, if we're getting high fours and getting the fives, then we probably want to look at uh, how much we're loading the body and, and maybe um, be a bit more smarter about um, our progressive overloads and our periodization of exercise because that's just not going to be sustainable long term. So now we have a bit more context as to the aerobic and anaerobic training effect scores and, and where they sit on the continuum of improving our fitness levels. It's probably time we discuss how they're actually derived. So starting with the aerobic training effect, that's essentially um, derived from this thing called EPOC. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, uh, it's a common one in exercise physiology. and Essentially, it means our excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Now, I had to read that out because uh, I usually get that wrong. I always, always uh, drop the uh, exercise uh, at the end of post there. But that's a common um, term, term you learn about in terms of exercise physiology, in terms of oxygen consumption. And it's something we'll discuss in greater depth in a, in a second because it has a massive influence upon deriving our uh, training effect scores, particularly aerobically. And so we also have the anaerobic training effect. Now, this varies compared to the aerobic training effect. So essentially, this is looking at conceptualizing and identifying the higher intensity efforts and surges within our workout that may contribute or help improve our anaerobic fitness base. So for example, this may be in instances such as um, going for a long run and, and having surges of intensity, or we might be going up a hill, or even if we're doing some fartlek sort of training, we're looking at conceptualizing and identifying those periods where we need some anaerobic assistance to facilitate that movement. So when we don't have 
um, that oxygen really available to get to those intensities. The body has to produce it anaerobically to facilitate that increase in force output. So that provides a good indication of that. It's a little bit harder to uh, conceptualize in terms of um, uh, compared to our aerobic training score. But as I've alluded to earlier, we need to discuss EPOC. Now, EPOC holds the key to these training effect scores. And essentially, our peak measurements of EPOC during a session is essentially going to translate into our training effect score. So EPOC is essentially an indication of our oxygen consumption as a result of completing exercise that's above our normal or resting oxygen levels. So when we're conceptualizing the idea of EPOC, what I've found particularly useful is to look at a pretty simple chart that's found in most exercise physiology textbooks. Now this one, I'll orientate you here. Essentially what it provides us is uh, Y and X axis. So on the X axis, we've got time, so the length of the exercise session. And then on the Y axis, we have oxygen consumption. Now oxygen consumption probably isn't the right term for this, but it will do for this particular tutorial. So essentially what we can see is at the start of exercise is an increase or a rapid increase in our oxygen consumption, which makes sense. And then we, it's not quite steady state. We can see that oxygen consumption is still steadily rising with uh, an increase in our duration. But then I've identified this value, uh, this epoch value. Now this is essentially our peak oxygen consumption that we've identified during our exercise session. So immediately after this peak e epoch value, we can see that oxygen consumption decreases. Now, so this is essentially when we're stopped exercising and when we're going into our, into our recovery. So now what Garmin does, it identifies EPOC basically as our peak value. So the peak value of EPOC we've achieved in the session, which I've identified in the graph, is what Garmin will use in its determination of training effect. Now what it does up until this point is that the watch will essentially track and update the EPOC as it's essentially received and calculated. So it won't take an average of the epoch throughout the session, it will just take your peak one. So it won't take into consideration all the earlier events. Essentially what will happen is it will identify your max and whenever that max occurs, that's when it will actually take uh, your epoch value. Now, in what is another thing that you need to wrap your head around is when we talk about epoch in terms of the watch, it doesn't actually take into account any measurements after you've finished exercising. Now, I know EPOC stands for post-exercise oxygen consumption, but for this in, um, purpose, Garmin won't take into account anything that happens after your session. So as soon as you've got rid of your recovery heart rate, that's it. Um, it's already calculated the EPOC from there. So this chart's fine. We can see that as the duration of exercise has increased, that our oxygen consumption has increased, which you know, makes sense. And it would be the same with intensity. If intensity increased, then our levels of EPOC would also increase. But the issue we have, or well, not necessarily the issue we have, the concern or the consideration is that EPOC isn't uh, directly derived from the Garmin watch itself. It's an indirect measure. So uh, the most accurate, reliable way we can determine our EPOC is actually in a lab in terms of respiratory exchange. But what Garmin will do, and with first beat as well, is it'll use our heart rate data to predict or provide an indication of EPOC. It's not a direct measure, which is what we need to talk about uh, in discussing how our training effect is actually calculated. So as I alluded to, Garmin's main metric that it can use to predict these values is off heart rate. So everything that we use is going to be a derivative from heart rate itself. So Garmin's direct measure of heart rate will then fuel the indirect measures or projections of its other metrics such as EPOC. But we know that there's a few other metrics that affect the EPOC as determined by the Garmin and First Speed Partnership. So I'll provide a nice little banner here that will conceptualize that for you. So EPOC is essentially uh, the sum or in the equation of intensity, which is heart rate derived. That's also an oxygen consumption metric as well. So we know uh, basic exercise physiology, there's a in a linear relationship linear relationship between oxygen consumption and heart rate. I won't get into uh, into the details on that in this video because that could be a whole other video in itself. But we know that there, as one increases, uh, so will the other, which is uh, that makes sense from a physiology standpoint. And then we also have duration of exercise. So I alluded to that before. The longer the exercise session generally, the higher the levels of EPOC. That's a, a generalization, but um, we can use that as a rule of thumb for this. And then EPOC at a previous time point. So essentially that's looking at or what Garmin's doing in terms of its algorithm is it's looking at EPOC during the session and it's trying to find the maximal one. So 
Uh, it doesn't matter when that occurs in the session, and it won't take an average of epoch. It'll essentially just grab the maximum, and that's what we'll use to help determine our epoch for the session, and then uh, going into our training effect score. So now we've determined where epoch is coming from, we can determine our training effect, or in this particular instance, our aerobic training effect. So essentially, our training effect is the product, or it's essentially peak epoch plus our training status. Now, what will happen is that pe that peak epoch that we derive in training will help or will be converted by Garmin and their algorithm into that zero to five score that we get uh, essentially after we finished our session. But what we also haven't talked about yet is our training status. So now, so our training status as determined by Garmin will also influence that training effect score. Essentially, it's using our previous data, our previous exercise data, and it's establishing a baseline as to where we're like where we are at. So it's important that we have a, a nice, healthy data set for Garmin to work with, because the more data we have, the greater the indication of where our fitness base currently stands, which is really important. Because what we can know, or what we know, is that with the Garmin readings, uh, particularly with uh, exercise sessions that may be high intensity intervals, that might might positively skew or favorably skew our fitness um, results or our base of fitness baseline essentially making us fitter than what we might actually be. And conversely, if we just do long steady state runs, then that may underestimate our fitness levels as well. So it's important that we have a nice uh, and thorough snapshot of our fitness status there, which can also be influenced by some of the settings we give Garmin as well. So it's important that um, we also have a nice little tidy data set there for Garmin to work with in terms of their algorithm. But what I also highlight is the importance of the heart rate data as well. So obviously heart rate provides the bulk of this information in terms of the epoch and our training effects. So there is a slight concern with Garmin uh, heart rate derived by just via the, the wristwatch itself. So if you're a, um, a keen athlete in terms of using your Garmin tech, then it's probably something or it's something you may would want to do is invest in a heart rate strap as well, particularly because we know that they provide a more reliable and valid uh, indication of your heart rate compared to just the wristwatch. So that's something you'd probably also want to do to ensure that your personal results are as most valid and reliable as they can possibly be. Now, again, anaerobic training effect is a little bit more complex uh, to dissect. It's not as cut and dry as the aerobic training effect is, and that's just because of the surges or the high-intensity efforts within our training session as well. It's pretty hard to... Pretty hard for me to conceptualize those to you uh, without an indication of how Garmin programs these within their algorithm. I think there's a lot of uh, algorithm work in the back end that will uh, help determine those uh, those efforts. But essentially, as I said previously, we know that the more surges and high intensity efforts we'll have throughout the exercise session, then the, uh, the greater the anaerobic training effect score will be. So that's probably something you can experiment with, I reckon, in your own sessions is see, okay, well, if I'm going to do a long steady state run on a 5K or whatever it might be, maybe do a little bit of uh, your own improvised fart leg within it. So maybe you know, utilize a couple of uh, high-intensity surges within that and see if your anaerobic training effect score is a bit higher, which I think and suspect it might be. So look out for that. might be even your own little experiment. So now when we interpret our training effect score, we have some sort of indication as to what it actually means. So Again, we're looking at a zero to five range. Zero is probably too little effect, and zero uh, and five, sorry, is probably too much of an effect. So, just to recap and really ram this point home, essentially what we want is um, anything between, I'd say, actually anything between probably two and a half and four and a half is sustainable levels of improvement. I'd say, in terms of the training effect scores, anything probably north of four point five is getting into some serious work, and it's something that you should look at. Uh, and where it fits in your own exercise schedule in terms of your load, uh, load management. But we now know that you know, 3 to 4.5 or 2.5 to 4.5 is where we want to sit from that point. But what we also need to identify using this chart is that if we're doing the same exercise sessions at the same intensities and durations uh, over the course of weeks, we're not going to see those levels of improvement that we would at the start in terms of that training effect. So as you'll see that that training effect will probably stagnate or will probably fall towards your, your 2.0, which will be maintaining. So it's important that we incorporate that idea of pro progressive overload to continue to get uh, those training effect scores that suggest we are positively uh, increasing our aerobic and anaerobic fitness levels. So it's important from that front that 
you keep um, including that progressive overlay. Now, essentially, essentially, we know that EPOC plays a big role in the training effect score. So how do we increase our EPOC? Well, I provide a nice little chart here that will uh, provide a nice little summary as to how we can do that and how we can continue to boost our training effect um, fit or basically improve our um, fitness levels. So how we do that, we can do it through any one of the different variables I've lifted, listed here. So we can do, or we can incorporate higher intensity exercise sessions, uh, obviously interval stuff or um, some higher intensity work, increase the duration of our sessions as well. Obviously, as I provided in that graph earlier, we can see that as duration increases, then EPOC will tend to increase as well. Um, to a point, there's yeah, there's a little there's a few other variables at play there, but generally a rule of thumb we can work with that. Uh, continuous exercise as well, so continuous running exercise in terms of, or, or bike riding, swimming, whatever it might be, but as long as it's continuous, whole body as well, so that you know, that fits into the running stuff. Not so weight training probably isn't the best for EPOC. Uh, intervals will be pretty good as well, so high intensity stuff that will probably help out your anaerobic uh, training effect score as well. So that's probably a good one there and active and short recoveries as well. So if we can keep the recovery periods short, then we can elicit or get back to those oxygen consumption levels a bit quicker as well compared if you go back to those full recovery uh, baseline levels and then, then go back up again. So if you follow these variables and include them within your progressive overload within your training program, then hopefully you'll continue to see an improvement as measured by your aerobic and anaerobic training effects from your Garmin watch. But that's about it for today. So I hope that you've got some value out of this video. And, and if you have, I'd encourage you to uh, subscribe and, and like, yeah, which you can do below there. It really means a lot. So if you've got any value from this video or anything else in the channel, it would mean a lot if you can help out and, and support the Triax channel. But until next time, I'll see you later. And thanks for tuning in.